And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it onto an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put in fresh wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. Amen. This is the word of God. Church, you may have a seat. If you have a copy of the scriptures, would you grab them and, and open to Luke chapter 5 that we just heard read? We're going to be walking through uh, this passage and a little bit before that as well, just to get some context. Excuse me, I got a little tickle in my throat. Well, uh, if you're new with us, welcome. So glad you're here at Risen Church uh, to worship with us. Uh, Zach, wanted to just say thanks for being sensitive to the Spirit and all just uh, getting on our knees. Uh, I haven't been in a, in a full room of people on my knees in silence in a long time. And that was just good for my soul to, just to be with the church body and be with the church family and to uh, have the prayers of the saints be lifted up and, uh, and just be silent together. We're so rarely silent together and still together in a world of constant noise and constant motion and constant buzzing in our f pockets with our phones and all the things. So, Zach, thank you for leading us in that moment. It was uh, refreshing to my heart. Um, well, this text that we just heard read, I just want to give you some context. We're going to we're gonna uh, rewind a little bit. I'm not going to re-preach -pre Brett's sermon, but uh, this story is at the same table. It's at the same meal. It's at the same space that uh, Jesus is teaching to uh, these rough and tough tax collectors uh, at, right after he calls Levi or Matthew. And so he's teaching at the table the things of the kingdom of God. He's teaching them about what it means to... Uh, to walk in the in the kingdom of God, and so today, uh, what we're going to look at, and it's it, it, and I, I love this, we're going to be talking about Jesus and food, right? Two good topics. Would you agree? Amen. Jesus and food, and so that's the context that we find ourselves here in the Gospel of Luke. In fact, I have a, a college friend of mine, the one of the first guys that I met in college. Uh, I went all the way up to. Uh, Lubbock, went to Texas Tech University. I know there's not too many of us around here. I'll get hissed at if I'm not too careful saying that out loud around these parts. But went all the way up there to the desert. I met a guy. Uh, he's, uh, he's still a great friend uh, today. He ended up, he, just, he loved food. He dreamed of opening his own restaurant one day. Well, he doesn't have his own restaurant, but he became a famous food blogger and food Instagrammer. Apparently there's a whole world where people on social media love to watch other people eat food. It's like a whole thing. And restaurants uh, pay him to come eat their food and take pictures of their food. And the whole, he's like hundreds of thousands of followers. Every time he posts a picture of himself eating something, uh, hundreds of comments and likes. It's a wild world we live in. So my friend Mike is one of these. One of these guys, and he was in the woodlands last week, so the tail end of the week, we, uh, he, I, he was like, hey, let's grab lunch. It's always very nerve-wracking to have a food blogger, blog, blog's not a word anymore, whatever that's called, a food influencer, that's the word now, uh, ask you to go out to, to lunch. And so I took him to Good Company. He loves Mexican. Uh, it's a good spot. They have great empanadas. He'd never been there. And so he's before the, the spread comes out. And he grabs his phone. He's like taking all these shots of it. I'm not allowed to touch it yet. He's getting, and then he grabs the tortilla and puts it in front of his face because apparently it's a good thing if you can see the, it's almost translucent, the tortilla. You can see through it. That's apparently a thing. Uh, he like breaks open the empanada on camera and all of his fans go wild, right? It's a strange thing. But we all, we, we're fascinated. We all love this. And so if you were walking, if you were scrolling through, you know, endlessly scrolling and you came across Mike's feed, you probably would have stopped because food is interesting. 
It brings people together. There's, there's a story to be told. There's stories to be shared. There's laughs around a table. There's all these wonderful things that's, that happened around a table. In fact, if you go visit friends from another state, uh, the thing that friends like to do is take you to their favorite restaurants that they love, right? It's like, you've got to try this place. And so you bring them to your favorite places, and they try the tastes of that city. There's entire, like, television networks dedicated to this. My daughter, Isabel, who's going to be 15 in a couple of days, she loves baking and cooking, and she just consumes food media, right? She doesn't have social media yet, but she loves, uh, she's got her, 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 her favorite person is Molly Ye. I don't know if anyone's heard of her but she's a baker and cooker, like cooker, that's not a word, right? Whatever, and, but she got to go meet Molly and she, she drove up to Dallas, Ashley took her, had her cookbook and got it signed and it's like this huge deal. Food is a big deal. People like freak out about food. People spend their time thinking about food. In fact, me saying this out loud, many of you are like, I wonder what I'm gonna eat for lunch today. Like, good company sounds good, I'm gonna go there, right? We just, we think about that and we get excited about it and that's normal. And you might say that in Luke's gospel, Luke is taking us on a bit of a food tour with Jesus. It's pretty fascinating. Um, he, he frequently presents Jesus as someone who is dining with all of these different individuals all through the entirety of Luke's gospel. It's a theme through Luke's gospel. So you, we have here, the one we're in, this, this, this is the first of many sort of table talks that Jesus gives uh, both those that, are, that don't believe in him, those that are close to him, those that are on the fringes, uh, want to believe in him, and those that are opposed to him. Often, most of these conversations are not, or many of these conversations happen around a table and around food. Here we have Levi, better known as Matthew, that... Uh, Brett taught us last week, and and he brings all of his tax collector buddies, right? And uh, and Brett talked to us last week. If you have, if you missed that, listen to this because all these sort of go the, these narratives build on each other, especially because we're taking smaller chunks right now. But it would be as if Jesus invited the mafia or was invited to the mafia table. It's this rough, tough. They're not r- well liked. They. You know, it's, it's an interesting table that Jesus is at, and then there's some Pharisees, and then there's the disciples that are here. And so it's this crazy uh, opportunity, this crazy thing that Jesus is sitting at this feast, and he's teaching them. He's teaching these people on the fringes or the edges of society, and Levi invites him into his own home and throws this great big party. Now, if you've been a part of Risen for any length of time, Maybe you've been visiting for the last few months. Maybe you've been with us for a long, long time. Um, we talk, uh, we've been talking a lot about hospitality. We have in the past. We, in fact, a few, like the last series that we ended before we were in the Gospel of Luke was all on gospel culture. How do we be a people that live out the culture of the gospel amongst our one, each other, our community, and those that are far from Jesus? How do we, how do we incarnate Jesus in the gospel to the places that he's called us to? We talk about what it means to be hospitable. My friend Devin, who goes here, he came and unpacked this understanding and idea of gospel hospitality in two sermons. And we've got one more to come that's going to be forthcoming. So the idea of opening up our homes and opening up our lives, the way that Jesus has invited you and I into and brought us into his kingdom is how we as believers in Christ should respond to that which Jesus has brought us in, we too should invite others into our lives that are far from him, that are strangers, and now that we have the opportunity to consider them friends. And we get the opportunity to do that around a table. Gospel hospitality. And so this text, uh, last week sets it up. This week is is the same is the same table, and many to follow in the Gospel of Luke give us a biblical rationale, a biblical case to say we can use our homes, we can use a table, we can use something as ordinary as a meal to display the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in people's lives, in our families' lives, in our neighbors' lives, in our friends' lives, in those that are far away from Jesus in their lives as well. 
And when you, when you start reading through Luke's gospel, I would encourage you not to just show up here and hear it for the first time, but start reading through it. Maybe read it through again, and, and it'll give so much more color and context as we walk through it. But Jesus is either at a meal, coming from a meal, or going to a meal. All through Luke's gospel. Right? And so... Um, if your fingers are nimble enough, you could, you could flip over to Luke chapter 7. It's the, it's the next dining scene. It's the next table talk. And Jesus is with one of the Pharisees who ask him to come over and eat with him. Now, this, this Pharisee isn't like uh, wanting to be very nice to Jesus in this interaction. He's wanting to trap Jesus. But Jesus uses this opportunity to teach a living example about the power of forgiveness at a table around dinner. And then in chapter 11, when you keep going, you're going to catch another glimpse of Jesus at a table, another table talk, if you will. And again, he's dining with a Pharisee. Luke 14, Jesus uh, is at a meal where he urges people to invite the poor into their meals rather than just their friends. Have you considered the poor? Have you considered the outcast, the marginalized? Do you ever invite them into your home to share a meal that you might hear their story? not just people who are like you. And Jesus presses into that in Luke 14, which we'll get to in uh, weeks ahead. Luke 15, the prodigal son, the one that we love, the story of the lost son returning, and the father throwing him a party and a feast. It ends at a table. It ends at a feast. It ends with a banquet and food and drink and celebration. Luke 19, Jesus invites himself over to dinner to Zacchaeus' place. Luke 22, the Last Supper. And then finally, Luke 24, the risen Christ. He comes and has a meal with two of his disciples in Emmaus, and then later he'll go and eat fish, another meal with his disciples in Jerusalem. Um, Jesus really is, in Luke's gospel, either at a meal, coming from a meal, or going to another meal. It's good news for me, a fat guy, right? Because I love eating. So it's like, okay, it's biblical. We can just keep eating and just work our way through, right? But it's significant here because Jesus is showing us at that table what he came to do, what he was about, and how he was going to go about it. Uh, there's a book where I, I, I read a lot of these and I got sort of the, the outline of this. It's a wonderful book, a guy named Tim Chester. He wrote a book called A Meal with Jesus. And if you're interested in learning more about sort of this concept or this idea of, of Jesus going through meal after meal through all of Luke's gospel, pick up Chester's book, A Meal with Jesus. It's a wonderful book, a great book about gospel hospitality and a great look at the gospel of Luke in this way with this lens. But he poses this question at the beginning of the book in the introduction, he said, how would you complete this sentence? The Son of Man came to, and many of us, if we've grown up in the church, we would say, came to seek and save the lost. True. Some of us would say uh, he came uh, not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, that Mark's gospel tells us. True. Very true. But Chester points out this fact in Luke 7, 34. He said, very few of us, I believe, would say in Luke, 3, in Luke 7, 34, that Jesus came eating and drinking. Interesting. Jesus came eating and drinking. And then and we'll say at the end of that, with sinners. With the ones you would never even believe he was at a table with. And so the first two that I mentioned... Seeking and saving the lost, come, coming not to serve, uh, but not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Those show us the primary way Jesus sought to save people, right? The primary ways that Jesus sought to save. And then the, the, the and, and how he was going to do that. And then, and then he lives that out. He functionally does that by sharing meals with them to articulate the message of the kingdom around a table by eating and drinking with them, using ordinary moments like that to say, come into my place, come into my home, or let me come into your home. And he teaches in those places. And so Jesus, for Jesus, those meals were occasions to display and proclaim revolutionary grace to the undeserving and to flip people's script on who and what they thought the kingdom of heaven was that Zach was just sharing with us earlier. To show us 
and, and display for us what gospel hospitality is all about. And by the way, hospitality, if you were here with uh, Devin's sermons uh, many months ago, is, I think he brought this up, that the word means uh, love for strangers. Hospitality is love for strangers. Uh, it's to be distinguished from uh, entertaining. We're not trying to show off. It's to be distinguished from uh, fellowship. When Christians get together, it's love for strangers that you would invite someone into your space, into your home that you don't know for the opportunity of getting to know them. That's where uh, strangers become friends. That's where strangers can become friends. And Jesus displays this so beautifully all through the gospel of Luke. Um, and Jesus, and I think in showing and displaying this, even as he's with Levi here in Luke chapter 5, uh, shows us there's this wonderful ability to engage in the mission of the gospel, to be able to articulate and explain and show and demonstrate the radical grace and love of God and the kingdom of God in an ordinary way around an ordinary meal that has eternal significant influence and impact. Isn't that wonderful? Um, and it's put on display right here. And the response uh, of the Pharisees is a little, they're, they're, they bristle against it a little bit. Um, Real quickly, I, I often get asked, uh, we've, we've had the wonderful privilege of getting to meet lots of new people since we've moved into this new building and people uh, kind of visiting our church and checking out our church. Maybe that's you here today. I want to say welcome. We are thrilled that you are here. We are thrilled that you have come and we hope you feel the hospitality and welcome of the Lord Jesus Christ here. We want to welcome you in with wide open arms. And often I get asked uh, as a follow-up to maybe some new folks say, how do I get plugged in here? What's the next step? And that's a great question. Uh, and that is a wonderful question. And I think in that question, embedded in it, if maybe you've been to different churches or you have grown up in the church, embedded in that question is a thought that there's a program or there's some uh, church program that answers that question. Those are not bad. Those are good. We have those things. Uh, we have uh, potlucks that we do, that we all gather around a table. We, we have the membership process where we walk through and then we have gospel care circles that you get placed in a deacon and deaconess team where you can be seen, known, and cared for and, uh, and deacon and deaconesses are following up with you and they're uh, connecting different people in community and meals are being shared and all those things. So those things are good and we love those things and we have those things, but I think what's uh, even better than those things that the best way to get connected to the heart and the life of Risen Church is to be a person that would take that next step and invite someone into your home and get to know them. To be a group of people that don't necessarily wait around for a program, but we would just have the old-fashioned sense of, I want to meet someone and get to know them and invite them over for a meal and share our stories together and encourage each other in the gospel. I think that's a wonderful way, and a lot of, I think a lot of times we wait around for things to happen for us, and I want to encourage us, if you're a member here, I want to encourage you uh, to look around. God is bringing people to our church, praise God, and maybe there's people that have been coming to our church for a really long time and you've never met them. Would you take the opportunity in the next week, two weeks, month, and start a conversation? Invite someone into your home. Open up your table. Share a meal with them. Begin to cultivate gospel hospitality, church. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus does it all over his ministry. He doesn't call people to a program. Programs aren't bad. Church, uh, those, those avenues are great. But let's relearn the art of just inviting someone over that you don't know to get to know them. Hey, do you want to come over for lunch? Let's share a meal. Uh, nothing fancy. I mean, we've had, we have people over, Ash and I, and it's like turkey sandwiches and chips because we don't have a lot of time to prepare things after. But we'll, we'll you know, let's, let's just, and it's beautiful. And it doesn't need to be complicated. Let's turn strangers into friends around here, church. So I just, that's, that, that's a little, another soapbox moment. I've been having a lot of those lately. But, um, and if you're new, uh, don't wait around for that either. You're, you're just as well, just, if, 
let's all do this together. It would be, just be a beautiful, wonderful thing to connect into the family of God here at Risen, and we would just be a people that would just be organically connecting. Yes, we are going to have those other things, but let's go above and beyond those uh, systematic ways and be a people that love and care for one another. And let's, let's have these lines of strangers uh, be broken down, and let's become friends. It's gospel hospitality. Um, all right. <coughs> so that's where we're going to be looking today. It's a table talk, and it centers around two particular questions with Levi. The first is, uh, the question is, why are you eating with sinners? Brett did a great job unpacking that. And the second question is, why are you eating at all? Right? Jesus can never get it right, right? According to everyone looking at him. He's like, you can't believe you're eating with these people. And then another group of people are like, I can't believe you're eating at all. So it's a question on feasting and the question on fasting. And so there's conflict, there's controversy here. And if you were with us a few weeks ago, uh, I talked about how starting now, we're beginning to see and Jesus walk into series after series of conflict and controversy as he walks through his ministry. And so the religious leaders are going to bristle up against a lot of the things that Jesus is doing and saying and, and, and unpacking, and they're going to be very controversial for the day. And they're going to say, who can forgive sin but God alone? And there's Jesus forgiving sin, saying, your sins are forgiven. Get up and walk. He's healing. He's forgiving. In the story of Levi, there's a controversy over friendship and fellowship and feasting. And he's saying, I can't believe you're eating with these sinners, the religious leaders. And then uh, in the text today, it's a controversy and it's a conflict over fasting. Why are you not fasting like all these other religious people do? All the other religious people that are serious about God fast all the time. And your followers don't. And they're upset. And next week or in two weeks, rather, Luke chapter 6, there's going to be controversy over the Sabbath. And so Jesus is presented to us here in a wonderfully powerful way as the friend of sinners, as the forgiver of the sinner, as the one who calls sinners to repentance and faith. The one today we read is the bridegroom of the church who has come, and the one who is Lord over the Sabbath. In a couple weeks we'll read in Luke 6. Now go back and listen to Brett unpacking the call of Levi or Matthew to follow him. He did a, a wonderful job. But at the end of the calling of Levi, Jesus explains the nature of his ministry. And he says, those who are well have no need of a physician. Meaning if you're, doing, if you're healthy and you're perfect, you have no need to go to the doctor. You can, there's, there's no need there. Um. He said, but those who are sick are the ones that need a doctor. And the Pharisees are having a hard time putting this together. Like, what are you talking about? Like, uh, they're, they're confused. And then Jesus sort of doubles down and re-explains uh, what he's doing. And he says, I've not come to call the righteous, or we know in his, what he's saying, the self-righteous, which is the Pharisees those who think they don't need a physician. I've not come to those that think they've done it all right and they're doing it all right and are perfect uh, by law keeping. I've not come to call them because they won't come at all. They're not gonna respond to my call. I've come to call the sinner to repentance. And so notice here how it is that we're healed through repentance as we've walked through this wonderful gospel how it is that we're saved through repentance. Jesus is with sinners. He's with these tax collectors. He's not there to just affirm what they're doing. No, he shows them grace and love, but he calls them to repent and to leave that lifestyle, to leave that sin, to follow Jesus, and he's modeling for us what we are to do as well. See, this is a good, this is a good side note for us, a good understanding of, of how we are to engage in mission, how we're to engage those that don't follow Jesus in our culture, those that don't follow Jesus in our schools, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, who we should be f friends with and how to engage it. Jesus doesn't require repentance first before loving them and eating with them. Did you catch this? Jesus doesn't say, clean up your act, then I'll share a meal with you. 
He doesn't say, get it right, then I'll come and talk with you. He doesn't require that first. He calls them into a context of a meal, or he walks into a context of a meal that he's invited in, that they are far from getting it all right. And so if you are in this place and you're not a Christian, you're here today and a friend invited you or a family member invited you, this is great news. Because you are not beyond the reach of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. All you need to know, if you are sick and you are wounded and you are searching and you're wondering about Jesus and you want to explore more of who he is and you've heard about the grace of Jesus and the mercy of Jesus and you're like, surely it can't be for me. I'm, I'm too far gone. These these stories right here, the, the table that Jesus is at should give you great hope because Jesus is the one that can cleanse. Jesus is the one that can heal. Jesus is the one that by his call and his word brings new life and new birth and a new creation in you. Amen? So the story of Levi at this table and, his, and the questions of, of these Pharisees is that Jesus has come for us all, church. And so there is great hope. And I think in all of these meal scenes in Luke's gospel, there's also a hint of the anticipation of a greater meal to come. Um, it's the same when Jesus comes and heals a person that we saw a couple of weeks ago. It's the anticipation Jesus is showing us and he's displaying for us the total healing to come in the new heaven and new earth. There will be no more pain, no more sickness, no more disease. When he casts out demons that we saw four or five weeks ago, it's a picture that there will be no more demons, no more demonic oppression present in the new heaven, in the new earth, in the new kingdom. And he's putting the kingdom of God on display for those that are watching. He's doing the same thing at this meal, that it would be but a foretaste of the great meal, the marriage supper of the lamb that you and I will enjoy forever one day with him in glory. See, our first parents in the garden, all the way back in Genesis, they ate forbidden fruit. And it caused separation from God. The, the, the setup was around food and a meal. And it caused separation. They were deceived. But Jesus has come to reconcile us back to God where we can eat and drink with him in a new garden one day forever. He's come to right all the wrongs. He's come to undo all the things that drag us down. And it's extended this wonderful hope, this wonderful message, this wonderful reality of Christ and his kingdom is extended to people like Levi and like me and like you. And it reminds us, church, if you are in Christ of the great mission that we have, that at even something as ordinary as a meal, we can turn strangers into friends. Even into brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, but we should be mindful as we do this that some religious uh, aren't going to like what we're up to. And that's true in Jesus' day. Um, but church... As we think about the context of this meal, I want us to consider how is the Lord calling you to get out of our comfort zone? And how is he calling me to get out of my comfort zone and find those Matthews, find those Levi's, find those tax collectors? They're all around us. Um, and extend a warm invitation to them. You know, come over. Like, I'd love to get to know you more that we can model this gospel-centered hospitality and show those that are far from God and bring them near to God through the good news of the gospel. Now, quickly, uh, Jesus and fasting. That's the last part of this story. Uh, first, Jesus was criticized for eating with sinners and these rough and tough group, and now he's criticized for eating at all. So a question is raised in verse 33. We heard it read earlier at the table. Remember, it's the same table, same group. Right here, uh, verse 33, they say, 
Uh, you know, the disciples of John fast, and the disciples of the Pharisees fast. So why don't your disciples? We don't know exactly who asks this question, so I guess we won't guess. But nonetheless, the question is posed. And Jesus' answer is very interesting. Verse 34, and he says, can you make wedding guests fast? It's like, what? Jesus just... He never answers the question directly, right? He just gives them another weird question. Like, what? Why are, can you make wedding? They're, they're probably just really confused. Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Can you imagine what Jesus is painting the picture of? He's like, can you imagine a wedding with no food, with no drink? First of all, no one would come, right? I mean, it would be like, uh, Hey, come to this new come to this wedding as we celebrate through fasting and weeping. The glorious union of these. Yeah, it would be like so bizarre and so weird. In fact, uh, this coming weekend we're having our very first wedding right here uh, in this building and in this space. So it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait for that. Um, but can you imagine getting a wedding invitation? It says, "No food, no drink. We are fasting." In fact, fast for a few days before. We're going to fast during the wedding ceremony. Uh, no, it's supposed to be a joyful celebration, not a join us. In, you get the invitation. Join us now in a spirit of contrition and brokenness as this new son-in-law enters our family. Please, Lord, pray for our daughter. <laughs> it would just be odd, and you would be like, we need to intervene here. There's something horrible has gone wrong, Right? A wedding is a celebration, there's, there's feasting, there's food, there's drink, there's dancing, there's a celebration of God bringing these two together, a new family beginning, a new life beginning, hope and possibility and potential and prayers and rejoicing and gifts are given, right? It's supposed to be a time of joy, a time of joy. <coughs> And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, when there's a wedding, you celebrate. He says, and I'm here, and the church is my bride, and I'm the bridegroom. I'm physically here with the disciples. Now is not a time for fasting. It's a time for feasting. It's a time for joy. It's a time for celebration. And then he says, there's going to be a time, in verse 35, when the bridegroom is taken away. Verse 35, it's, uh, you can, if you can put that on the screen, it says, The day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Church, this uh, is the first time, or the first reference here in Luke's gospel to the cross, many believe. He's explaining, there's a time where I'm not going to be here. There's a time where I'm going to be taken away in a little while. And when that time comes... They will fast. When the time comes and the cross comes and he dies and he resurrects and he ascends into heaven, they will fast because there will be a longing in their souls for Jesus, their Lord, their Savior to return. They'll be living in this in-between world that they got a taste of him and the joy of him and the, and the hope of Messiah, but he will go away and there will be, it will be not right There'll be a great burden, so then they'll fast, he says. But not in this unique moment in which Jesus is speaking at this meal. He said it would be silly to fast. He goes, it's, it would be silly to fast when I'm present with them. Now, quick question, just a thought for us. What place are we in? Should we be feasting or should we be, we be fasting? It's a good question. Should we be uh, rejoicing or should we be uh, just waiting uh, and, and fasting and, and remembrance and contrition and all these things that fasting represents? Well, I think we're in a time of both. We're in a time of both and. Uh, we're in a time of great joy as Christians. We have the Holy Spirit. Jesus has come. He sent to us the helper. 
the Holy Spirit, who is a seal for us one day that will be with him forever, who leads and guides and directs. But the bridegroom has not yet come. He will come again one day. So we're in a both and. There are times of feasting as Christians, and there is times of fasting as Christians because we know the world is still broken. We know the world still needs him. We know the gospel message and the mission of him needs to go forth so that more and more people can come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, forgiven, redeemed, and healed. So we have an anticipation and a longing for one day for him to make it all right. And yet we still today have a great joy uh, that we can feast and celebrate because he came long ago and he's given us the deposit and seal of the spirit to walk through this world in holiness and faithfulness to him. So we're in in between. Um, We're joyful yet longing. Um, and he says the bridegroom is here in this moment. And he's, he's pointing out to it's most likely the religious leaders here that dead religion doesn't bring joy, but Jesus does. And he says right now it's time for joy. But that joy is not consummated yet. It's not completed yet, to use uh, the marriage analogy, because the bridegroom has been taken away. But one day, church, we'll see him again. We will see him face to face. And all of our longings and all of our frustrations and all of our anxieties and all of our sin and all of our brokenness and all of our sickness will be dispelled in his presence. And we won't fast anymore ever again. We'll be at the feast and he'll be at the head and we will be rejoicing and we will experience unattainable unfathomable joy but now there's a mingling in the Christian experience in the life that you and I live (coughs) of sorrow and joy of delight and yearning for more and longing of him and that's okay Um, but I think what Jesus is teaching us even here in the call to fast is that our fasting should even be Christ centered that's what he says about the bridegroom Jesus uses this occasion. It uh, says, when you do fast, it should be Christ-centered. It should be a longing for the bridegroom to return. So fasting isn't just about us denying ourselves so that we uh, could say that we've done so. It's, it, it points to Jesus. It makes us long for more of him. It makes us pray for his return and hasten the day that he will come back for us. That's the day we're all longing for. And then he uses this point, this moment, to, to tell two parables to end out chapter 5. And I'll read them here since they were read at the very beginning. And maybe you've forgotten with all of my talking. Verse 36 and 39. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new. And the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. And he uses this to describe the overall nature of his ministry and all that he's been teaching. So after this sort of give and take discussion uh, at the table, he gives uh, this parable, he gives this commentary, and he's like, well, if you, if you put a new patch uh, on an old garment, it's... It, it won't work, it will stretch, it won't fit right. If you try to put new wine in old wineskins, the wineskins uh, will burst. Um, and Jesus is teaching us, I think, here, that he has not come simply to be an add-on for the religion of the day. I'm not just a patch. I'm not an add-on to what you're already doing. I'm not just a a piece, a small piece of the puzzle that you can just tack on or you can uh, integrate into that which is already there. I'm doing something brand new. If you try to do that with me, it won't work. It won't fit. It will break. I'll break that thing, essentially, is what he says. If you try to do that, I'm going to break the vessel you try to fit me into because you can't hem me in. You cannot squeeze me into your molds. You cannot squeeze me and put me and add me on to a few of your performed traditions. I've come to bring new wine. I've come to bring in a new age. 
I've come to bring a brand new creation. And you need a new cup to receive all that I'm bringing. And the Pharisees don't want it. Um, and it's sad because at verse 39, he says, no one after drinking old wine desires new wine. They say, the old's just fine. Um, he said, I, I like it the way it is. And Jesus wants to bring us new wine. And all that he is bringing brings a whole new life. It brings new joy, he talks about. It brings freedom, he talked about in the synagogue. It brings forgiveness that he gives uh, to the paralytic. He brings a new creation. He brings new life to the leper. You would think that everyone would want this, but some just prefer the old ways and say, we're good. Thanks, thanks a lot, but I'm fine. Jesus has come to bring new wine. He's come to bring full freedom, full forgiveness, new creation. And he calls us to leave the old and to follow him in the new. To repent and to follow him. Not a patch to your current life, not an add-on to uh, your current uh, rotation, your current disciplines, but something brand new. And so we're left here, even you and I, church, are left with an option in front of us. We can experience the grace and transformation and forgiveness and healing that Levi did at that table when he left everything to follow Jesus because he knew he was worth it. Or we can just stay stuck in the rut that Zach talked about earlier. Oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll just tack them on here and here. There's an old story that I've heard. Uh, it's, there's an eagle at a tourist attraction beautiful bird uh, and this eagle's tethered to this pole um, and sadly people come to look at it and the eagle just walks around the pole over and over again all day and it's thrown food and it eats it in the track and it's it walks around this pole so often every single day eats its food and people come and take pictures of it and it just digs this rut it just gets deeper and deeper as it circles around the pole over and over and over again. Well, one day the, the tourist attraction comes under new ownership, and the new owner thinks, this is cruel. This bird needs to soar. I know. We'll, we'll create a whole event, and we'll free the bird. It will soar, and we'll see the wings of this eagle spread, and it fly into the air and do what it's created to do. And more people will come to see this bird soar than see it chained and tethered to a pole. And so they have this big event. People gather from all over, and they want to see the eagle soar, and they want to get, they want to just get a glimpse of this, this caged bird finally be able to fly, and they release it, and they take it off of its tether. And much to everyone's dismay, the bird does nothing. It just keeps walking in a circle. Because that's all it's ever known. Round and around and around, and doesn't even know doesn't care just keeps walking around this is the point jesus is making this is what the pharisees were doing jesus has come to free us to forgive us to heal us to give us that which we couldn't even imagine and they're stuck in a rut and they're just content with walking in it and jesus is saying i've come to bring something brand new but you have it i want you to embrace it I want you to embrace that which is new, not just attack on, not just walking the same old ruts and praise God today, church, that following Jesus is a life of joy. It is a life of hope. It is a life of real forgiveness, a life of healing. And he gives us so much beauty and hope in this world and grace. He is our bridegroom. We are his bride in this analogy. And one day we will see our Lord Jesus Christ and fasting will end and the ultimate feasting will be begin at the marriage supper of the lamb that will make every food show and every blogger and every influencer look foolish in comparison to what jesus has ushered us into and it will be a beautiful wonderful day and he will wipe away every tear we'll have no more sickness no more pain no more relational conflict no more of all these things that that we fast over because the feast is coming one day and we cling to that hope all because of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He's made it possible. And to him we praise. Amen? Church, let's pray to him this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Um, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have invited the undeserving to this feast. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us grace, forgiveness, and healing. And Lord, thank you that you didn't come as just an add-on and a patch to our already okay lives, but you've come uh, and called us to repentance and faith, and you've come to bring something brand new. And Lord, we rejoice in it, and we thank you that walking with you is a life of joy and one of great hope in the future. Lord, we didn't deserve it, we didn't earn it, but you called us into it, and we rejoice today because of it. Thank you that you've come to bring new wine. Lord, today I pray for all of us here in this room. Would you give us hearts of gospel hospitality that is displayed here at this table? Would you teach us and help us as your people lean into, Lord Jesus, that which you have displayed and demonstrated for us today, that our table could be filled with strangers and see those strangers turn into friends and even family and brothers and sisters. And Lord, when we gather at a table, when we take um, the food and the joy of that, would we remember you in it, even as something as ordinary as a meal at home with a stranger that you're calling to be friend in the kingdom? Help us to live out the mission of the gospel in our lives now so that we can hasten the day of your return and see you face to face one day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Church, we stand and sing songs of praise to him this morning.